If you're glad to know that God is real, uh, that He is risen, He is risen indeed. Come on, won't you put your hands together? Early Sunday morning, we say it each and every week. Early Sunday morning, He got up with all power in His hands. Indeed, I'm glad that you have caught decided that it was not proper to get on up early this Sunday morning to come back to give our God praise. Amen and amen. And 
indeed whether you are here in the sanctuary and made your way on the sanctuary early this morning or if you just rolled out of bed and turned on service at home that's all right too we're glad to have you with us uh, on this beautiful sunday morning that god has blessed us with he is risen he is risen indeed uh, on uh, this easter sunday morning we're reminded that he is risen became something of a cold word uh, for believers as they spoke to one another and they would say he is risen and if indeed you were a believer folk would uh, respond back in kind he is risen indeed so let's try it this morning he is risen one more time he is risen he is risen indeed amen i'm glad that you are here welcome uh, to one and all as we've come to give god glory on this morning now as we begin as is our custom i invite you uh, to stand to your feet as we prepare to read our responsive reading it'll be right there on the screens for you i'll read the part that says leader I invite you to read the part that says people and then we'll read that last line all together amen Let us begin. Friends, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. For three days he lay in that cold and lonely cave. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our risen Lord. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. All together, come, let us worship the risen Christ. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Great God, we thank you again for allowing us the grace to be able to get up and to come and to worship you this morning. We thank you, God, that you got up that allows us still all these years later uh, to get up ourselves and to continue to press on in this world. And though it is still a little dark and though the sun has not yet shined, God, we're grateful that indeed your sun comes and shines for us every day. So now, God, we invite and invoke your presence in this place. And on this day, when your children all over the world are celebrating the fact that you got up, we remember that we are connected to a history, a tradition, a legacy uh, that goes long before us. And one of the ways that we remember that and are connected to that is by praying that prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. you remain standing as we prepare to sing our congregational hymn for today. So appropriate on this day. And those in the best view, come on, y'all can make your way into the sanctuary. It's all right. Uh, no need to rush. We're glad to have you on uh, this morning. But our hymn for this morning is great old hymn of the church. Because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. Amen.
that is more than just a song you sing, but your testimony. Come on, we bless God today because he lives. Uh, we can face tomorrow as you take your seats uh, in God's house because he lives. All fear is gone. And I know oh, oh, who holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Let me take this uh, opportunity again uh, just to welcome everyone into the sanctuary today. So good always to see you, but certainly early on this Sunday morning. I was with uh, my sister beloved uh, over at Elmwood uh, on Friday, and she said as it relates to sunrise service that the real worshipers come uh, to church on Easter Sunday morning. The real worshipers, amen. Uh, I don't know if I want to make that distinction, amen, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've made your way uh, to the sanctuary, and I wanted to see if we had any uh, first-time visitors with us today. I just ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to say a thing, uh, but if you could just stand, we just want to be able to recognize you. Amen. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, indeed, we're so glad to have you today. Hope that you feel at home. And so, Bethany, y'all know what we want to do. Make sure that you turn around, catch these visitors, now family, by eyes. Let them know that you're glad to see them. Wave real big. Give them the biggest smile you can. I let them know that we're glad to see them in God's house on the day. You can take a seat when you like. For those at home, go ahead and get those uh, cell phones out. Send somebody a text. Let them know you're glad to see them early, early on Sunday morning. It's good to be in God's house. Let's welcome one another. In God's grace, amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to Bethany Baptist Church, pastored by the Reverend Dr. Timothy Atkins Jones. Our mission is to recruit, equip, and deploy witnesses for Christ. Here are this week's announcements. Bethany's Grief Ministry will meet on Saturday, April 6th at 10 a.m. in the church loud. All are welcome to attend even if it may be your first time. This is a safe and sacred space for healing. The next session will be facilitated by Pastor Timothy Adkins-Jones. Also on Saturday, April 6th, 
joined the Bethany Baptist Church Jazz Vespers Committee as they welcome tenor saxophone player and jazz vocalist Camille Thurman, who will be joined by the Daryl Green Quartet. Doors open at 5.30 p.m. This event will also stream live at tinyurl.com slash Camille Thurman Jazz. Beginning on April 7th, we will have a time of prayer before service in the chapel. All are welcome to join us for communal prayer from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Our leadership will have a time of prayer at 9.30 a.m. before preparing for service. We now bring your attention to a message from Sister Sylvia Alston. Good morning, Bethany. My name is Sylvia K. Alston, and I am the Vice Chair of the Bethany Trustee Board. The Bethany Baptist Trustees Ministry is pleased to announce that April is National Financial Literacy Month. National Financial Literacy Month is nationally recognized to promote the awareness of the public's understanding that financial literacy is hugely important. At Bethany, we know that sound money management is an important component of sound financial Christian living. The Bible references over 2,000 scriptures that relate or discuss money, its management, stewardship, investment, generosity, and planning for the poor. The Strategic Planning Committee is working on providing important programming this year to address these important discussions. So on April 20th, 2004, the Bethany Trustee Board, in partnership with the Strategic Planning Committee and Chase Community Bank's Newark Branch, will host a financial seminar workshop the workshop will be hosted by Chase Community Bank in Newark, New Jersey, and their bank manager, Melissa Prashad, who will join us as our event sponsor, as well as our host for the workshop. So on April 20th, 2024, the Bethany Trustee Board is pleased to announce the kickoff of National Financial Literacy Month's workshop right here at Bethany. Thank you, Trustee Alston. Next, join us on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., beginning on April 24th, for the Bethany Discipleship Institute. This eight-week program consists of three Bible studies led by Pastor Atkins Jones and our ministerial staff. Pastor Atkins Jones will be teaching a class called Life Together in the chapel. Reverend Renee Brown Johnson will be teaching the presence, power, and promise of the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew and Greek biblical texts in our seminar room. Reverend Ross Upshaw will be teaching Walking in Wisdom in the Sunday School Room. Please note that classes will not meet on May 22nd and May 29th. If you are interested in attending a class virtually, please be on the lookout for more details. If you are a caregiver for aging or ailing loved ones and would like to become involved with Bethany's Caregivers Ministry, please call the church office or send an email to get in touch with Reverend Renee Brown Johnson. This ministry will begin with virtual introductory discussion sessions on Zoom. Please note that we will be voting on our church constitution as a congregation at our quarterly meeting in April. If you need a physical or digital copy of the constitution to review, you may contact the church office. The Repast Ministry is looking for members who can assist with the coordination of repast gatherings at Bethany. This fulfilling ministry is a vital part of the caring communities at Bethany. It supports grieving members and their families who have lost a loved one at a most difficult time. For more information on how you can join this ministry, call the church office. If you would like to participate in the food pantry and clothes closet ministry, all are welcome to come by the church to offer your assistance from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Tuesdays or Thursdays. Our Matthew 6-9 prayer call takes place on weekdays at 6-9 p.m. And the Women's Ministry Soul Sister prayer call takes place every second Saturday of the month at 9 a.m. Bethany's Men's Fellowship will meet on the second Saturday of the month at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Please contact Brother Dorian Tisdale or the church office for more information. We also invite you to join us on Wednesdays at noon for our in-person midweek worship service. To stay connected with us, you may text BBC to 33222 or follow us on social media at Bethany Baptist Newark. In addition, if you feel led to join us in our work and mission, you may text Join BBC to 33222. Now, back to today's service. 
Amen. Thank you, Ms. Rebecca, indeed, as always, for our announcements. And look forward for all the things that are going on in the life of our church. And certainly, uh, as we continue on today, just want to lift up uh, a couple things. One, I want to take a second just to welcome uh, my parents in the house. Uh, my mother uh, certainly uh, preached the house down along with six other sisters on Friday. Uh, but it's good to have Anthony and Reverend Renee Jones in the building. Um, and also, uh, you all have heard me uh, say uh, multiple times, uh, whether in sermons or in Bible study or just in conversation, uh, that there are uh, some brothers, some folks, some friends uh, that knew me long before it was Reverend Dr. Anything. Uh, in fact, still I uh, have a way in the group chat and otherwise uh, teasing the fact that it's Reverend Dr. Anything. And one of those uh, friends, one of my dearest friends in life, uh, Adam Harper, is here. Uh, wave a hand. Amen. Good to see you, brother. So glad that you're with us uh, on today as well. I'm very excited about our Bethany Discipleship Institute uh, that's coming up beginning in a few weeks uh, towards the end of April. Reverend Ross and Reverend Renee uh, have been working very diligently and we're glad to be able to offer now three different classes in our same uh, Bible study time slot so that you can get in where you fit in. Our class indeed on uh, the works of the Holy Spirit in uh, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Uh, indeed the wisdom literature uh, that Reverend Ross will be teaching and then my class will be on our theme for the year, Life Together, and we'll be looking at all of the each other passages in scripture uh, where we are instructed to, to encourage one another, to love one another, to exhort one another, to spur on one another, etc. Uh, and so hopefully amidst those three classes, uh, there's something that piques your interest. And so we're excited uh, for that. And there'll be uh, some youth programming along with that as well. And so as we get a little closer, we'll continue to give you more details, but we just want to let you know that that's coming so that you can put that on uh, your radar and begin to plan for that uh, in person. We'll, we'll create some virtual options as well, but we'd love for you to be in person for our Bethany Discipleship Institute. Uh, lastly, let me just uh, remind us of all the things that are going on uh, today. Uh, one, we want to thank uh, Pastor Tisdale as uh, the Easter lilies that we have on the pulpit today are in honor of uh, her beloved mother, uh, Sister Virginia Perry. And so we want to give uh, her much love as she looks on down uh, from heaven on us today. Day. Uh, but certainly invite you on back. You know we have uh, after service today, a little bit after service, uh, we have our breakfast today. And then after that, uh, we have our 10 o'clock service today. For those that want to hang around, you certainly can eat and dip. That's all right. Uh, but we're going to have a great time and worship again at 10 o'clock if you'd like to stay. Uh, and in addition to just service is always wonderful, but we also will be doing baptisms today. And that's always uh, such a beautiful and important time in the life of our church. I believe actually five people being baptized. Uh, as we begin our 10 o'clock service today. So even if you can't be here, come on, put your hands together as we celebrate what God is doing. Uh, and then after service, uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt for our, uh, for our young people, indeed, for our children. So a lot going on on this day, but it's a day worthy. It's a day worthy of celebration, worthy of doing a lot of things as we celebrate the fact that he did not stay dead, but in fact that he got up early on Sunday morning. Amen and amen. All right, y'all, without further ado, it's offering time. As we get back unto the Lord, which the Lord has so richly and freely given unto us. Remember, uh, for those indeed that have been uh, giving and or have been waiting to give their Lenten offering, today is the day. Amen. Uh, as some have gone above and beyond uh, their normal tithes and offering uh, to give for our Lenten season, I uh, certainly will be glad to receive that on today. Uh, there are a few ways to give. You can give online at bethan-norg.org slash giving. Uh, you can give via text at 973-339-0329. You can give via cash app at dollar sign Bethany Baptist Newark. And certainly always grateful uh, for those that to bring in or mail in their tithes and offering. Uh, here in the sanctuary, you absolutely can pull out your phones and give uh, or virtually or online. Uh, but if you have a physical offering to give, uh, just wave your hand as soon as I finish praying. And one of our ushers will gladly make their way uh, to receive your offering today. Uh, so won't you bow with me for a word of prayer? Great God, again, we are grateful uh, that you have uh, blessed us to have anything to give in the first place. Now, God, help us to be the cheerful givers that you designed us to be. As always, it's in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen and amen at home. Go ahead, take a lap around your living room. Get those thumbs moving. Here in the sanctuary, if you need an usher to make their way to you, just wave a hand as we bring our tithes and offering unto the Lord. Amen.
rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice. 
worthy of all our praise. Come on, if you're able, won't you stand to your feet? Amen. He got up uh, so we can get up to. Amen. Come on, bow with me for a word of prayer. Great God, we thank you. We love you. We honor you. We are grateful for you, for all that you've done to be able for us just to be here on this day, let alone, God, as we look back over these weeks and recognize, God, everything you had to do in us for us to be able to go and to earn money in the first place. So thank you, God, for blessing us the ways that you have. And now, God, won't you take and use it, indeed, this great offering for the revealing of your kingdom, the proclamation of your gospel, and that lives might be transformed both inside and out. And it's in Jesus' great name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to read a selection of scriptures from Mark chapter 16. We'll read verses 1 through 8. Um, I know many will probably read along, read, uh, along with uh, on uh, your phones or maybe on the screens. Um, some maybe, maybe even have a physical Bible today. Um, but some Bibles will let you know that in the earliest transcripts, the earliest manuscripts, uh, this passage is actually where Mark ends. Uh, the Mark chapter 16, verse 8 is the last verse in Mark. And it goes on uh, from, with some later transcripts and manuscripts. But as we get ready to pray, I want to think about what it would mean if the end of the gospel resurrection story stopped at verse 8. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 begins this way. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother James, and Salome bought spices. And they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb before us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But when he said to him, do not be alarmed. You seek Naz Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. They went out quickly and fled the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. 
fear, I think, is not an emotion we readily associate with resurrection, the celebration, and the joy of this day. Fear is not something that we always think about. But in a world that is more associated with and more familiar with death, it seems like the breaking and the ending of that cycle might be something we should fear. At the very least, it should be something that we have a deep reverence for. And so I invite you to join me now in a word of prayer as we think about what it means to sit in the variety of emotions, uh, of emotions that come uh, on this Resurrection Sunday. Come on, won't you bow with me? Most grace God, I think that sometimes this story that we rehearse, not just year after year, but frankly, God, week after week, God, that we can say it and repeat it so much that sometimes it may lose its grandeur. Sometimes, God, we may forget just how unusual and shocking it is to say that a man that was dead was not dead anymore. Not that he was brought back because of CPR, breath came back immediately after flatline, but three days later, after spending time in a tomb, after being expected that his body would begin to change and decay, that know that this man got up, and not only got up, got up with all power in his hands, not only got up with all power in his hands, but in getting up had to somehow have a stone that was bigger than five folk be rolled away. God, it's unusual. God, it's a little scary. I wonder, God, what it means for us to reflect on that fear today. To reflect on the reverence that we must have for a God that has power over death itself. Maybe, God, it's enough for us to straighten ourselves up. Maybe it's enough, God, for us to rededicate ourselves, not just for the joy of the resurrection, God, not just for the fact that he got up and we can have life, but also it reminds us that we serve a God that has that kind of power. God, that we are acquainted with a Savior that cannot be beat by death. And so I pray, God, if there is anyone that has come to this sunrise service with a little fear and trepidation, maybe God is not about the story. Maybe God is not about the tomb and, and the fact that he got up, but maybe there's some things going on in their lives that are bringing some fear and trepidation. Maybe there is some nervousness and some anxiety that is resting on folk as they've come to the sanctuary today. God, maybe, just maybe, you brought somebody early on this Sunday morning that needed to be with you, that, that needed to be reminded of the story they've heard for years, that needed to be reconnected, and maybe even find a new family. And so, God, if everything is not joy and sunshine, Easter outfits and Easter egg hunts, God, if there's some hurt and some pain in the sanctuary today, I pray that the joy and the power that comes from your resurrection might speak. I pray, God, that the unifying nature of this resurrection story that, that calls and brings and, and beckons us all to this moment might be a salve for somebody that's hurting in this moment. I, I pray, God, that someone get connected. Either, God, with us here at Bethany, or either, God, just with you, or maybe, God, just with someone that they find on their pew today. God, may someone build a new relationship on today for the resurrection in addition to being supernatural. Absolutely was a way that folk connected and built bonds that literally would last lifetimes. And so, God, we bring so many things to y'all to today, so many things, God, to the empty tomb on today. And I know, God, that you're big enough and that you're grand enough to meet us all. And so, God, if we walked in with a hallelujah today and we were just waiting uh, for somebody to say amen or say the name of Jesus and we're ready to shout, we're glad to be here today and we're glad that you might bless us. If, God, there are folk that just came because they're supposed to come on Easter, God, we're glad you're here. God, if there are folk that came uh, because they might have come anyway, but God, they, they had to drag themselves and put their good face on because they don't want to know how much hurt is being hidden on the inside. God, we're glad they're here too because your spirit is big enough and your spirit is grand enough to meet us all exactly where we are. So meet us there, God. 
as we move away from the horror of the cross and to the wonder and amazement of an empty tomb that we heed the call not to fear but to remember God that you are risen that you are risen indeed now God won't you continue to bless our praise team on today as they continue to lead us to your throne of grace and mercy may you God strengthen your preacher to preach one more time that indeed he got up as always it's in Jesus great name we pray amen and amen
Sometimes you just have to repeat it to yourself. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Jesus, even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't feel like it. You have to keep telling yourself, victory. Victory belongs to Jesus. And if we say it enough, if we believe it enough, we'll start seeing again that it is as true yesterday uh, as it is today, as it will be tomorrow. And the victory indeed belongs to Jesus. Come on, if able. Won't you bow with me for a word of prayer? Great God, who are we that the Lord of all the earth would care to know our name? Let alone God allow us to come to this your sanctuary to give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. So though God, we come in with great praise in our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts. God, we also come in recognizing that we have fallen short of your glory. But I thank you, God, that you loved us so much that you sent your son for us anyway that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God, in light of this awesome and powerful display of love, I just pray I'm able to take the wisdom of the old preacher who said, hide me behind the cross. And of the psalmist who declared, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, we pray, be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. God, I trust that whatever it is we need today, you'll give it to us. If we need to be convicted, you'll convict. If we need to be comforted, God, you'll wrap your arms around us. We need to learn today, God, you'll teach us, God, if we need to sit in awe of your wonder, that's where we sit. And God, if indeed it's time to celebrate, you'll start departing. Whatever it is, God, we need today, believe that you'll give it to us in your name. And so it's in that name. And the blessing of beautiful, matchless, and marvelous name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. I know you're expecting one of the Gospels today, but uh, both at 6.30 and at 10. We're not going to be in the Gospels today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're reading verses 12 through 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 20. If you have it, won't you say amen? amen. If not, say pastor, 6.30 in the morning. You read it to us. Amen. 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 <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12, goes this way. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. But if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men the most pitiable. But now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Uh, for the time that we have to share this morning, I'd like to preach from the topic, if. If. Seven times. It's repeated seven times in this passage of Scripture, and each time 
it lands like a freight train on our ears. If, in the midst of constructing an argument from the negative, Paul drops seven of the loudest ifs, ifs on us that you'll ever hear. Each if building on the next, literally challenging the foundation of our faith. It's just two letters, but it's a strong word. It may be diminutive, but it can be dynamite. And if we step away from the passage in order to make our point and come back, how different would American history be if colonizers had decided to try to make peace with the Native Americans and ask to share the land? What if the African slave trade had been unsuccessful? Where would it be if the British had actually won the American Revolution? What would be going on if Lincoln hadn't signed the Emancipation Proclamation? What would be our legacy if Reconstruction had actually worked like it was working when it was working? Where would we be if there had been no civil rights movement? What if Sister Rosa stayed in her seat? What if Stokely kept quiet? What if King had gotten that job he wanted as a professor and had never become a preacher like his daddy wanted him to be? What if he hadn't been shot? What if Malcolm hadn't gone to Mecca? What if he didn't stop by the Audubon Theater that day? What if we never went to Vietnam? What if Nixon hadn't made marijuana a Schedule I drug and started this war on drugs? What if crack never came to the community in the 80s? What if we never heard somebody say super predators? What if Bush H or W had not won? What if Illinois had never taken a chance on a junior state congressman? What if he'd listened when they said he was too inexperienced to run? What if we never elected him because we'd never seen a brother in that position before? What if he hadn't mentioned that if he had a son, he would have looked like Trayvon? What if he hadn't faced unprecedented opposition in Congress? What if he'd groomed a new fresh face for the party? What if? Fox News never existed. What if we took 45 seriously when he first came down an elevator and started offending Americans left and right? What if yeah. Senator Clinton had won? What if COVID had been contained in one city? What if we had a different president when it all went down? What, what if we had shut down earlier? If it's a small word, but a word with a whole lot of power. Its effect on national and international history is enough to keep your mind churning for a long time, but its potential power in our lives more personally might tug at our heartstrings even more. What if I had listened when mama first told me to go to church? What if I hadn't shown up at the spot when my boy told me that he needed a ride real quick? What if I had applied myself earlier? What if I was born in a different neighborhood? What if I had the advantages that folk that were not touched like nature's son around me had? What if I didn't have to see addiction and divorce and pain and struggle? What if my kids listened to me? What if I listened to them? What if I had eaten right earlier in life? What if I had taken my medicine when my doctor told me to take it? What if I had gone to the doctor in the first place? What if, if I didn't have to have that last drink? What if? That's a big word for only having two letters. And in our passage for today, the power of if is fully displayed. In these verses, Paul uses the word if seven times, like I said, and, and his if is the greatest if words seem blasphemous on any Sunday, but particularly as we gather Ma, on Easter Sunday morning. Paul asks the question, what if Christ was not raised from the dead? What happens if Christ didn't get up? He says, if that's the case, then our preaching is futile. Our faith has no power. Forgiveness is a myth, and there is no hope. Oh, what a world it would be if Christ had stayed in the grave. This question is posed in this book, 1 Corinthians, which is one of actually the earliest writings in the New Testament. Pastor says, Dale, this letter is written decades before the Gospels, before Acts, before Revelations. It's one of the oldest New Testament letters that describes this Christ event. And as he writes, Paul makes sure to refer to the authority of the tradition that comes before him that is not too far removed 
from eyewitnesses to the Christ event. Repeatedly throughout 1 Corinthians, he talks about how other people had gotten the story before him, and he is simply continuing the line. Paul is calling all through 1 Corinthians. We spend a lot of time there, particularly during the pandemic, that all through uh, Corinthians, and by extension, all the members of the early church that would have read this letter need to be stopped being divided by the things that separate members of the body of Christ. Stop worrying about who the pastor is. Stop uh, worried about having fractures in the community between the haves and the have-nots. He commands them to avoid idols. He urges them to resist public disputes and censure. He teaches about how to handle different gifts and how love should run church order, how we ought to handle each other. Paul speaks his own mind with thoughts and ideas without apology, but he always leans heavily on the tradition that he comes from. He's sure to state that the gospel he has received is not an invention, but a recollection. Christ died, was buried. He rose again on the third day, was seen by Peter and the crew, 500 brethren, James and all the apostles and the sister. And even he saw him himself on the road to Damascus. He's preaching what has been passed down and what he knows for himself. He is there as he writes this letter to unite the church, to unite the people around one banner, one cause, one central unifying event that is strong enough, bold enough, radical enough, revolutionary enough to hold all these different rusty, dusty folk together from different places with different backgrounds with different money, with different races together. Paul is there to gather them around the shared experience of the resurrection. So if the resurrection is not real he's been up to a fool's errand the whole time. So there it is in our passage for today. Paul is using that shared knowledge, that shared understanding of Christ's resurrection to gather the community again. Being the great teacher and preacher that he is, greater teacher than preacher if we're telling the truth. But Paul makes the argument by making the community look at the opposite. What if Christ had not risen from the dead? What if? I got to be honest, Pops, it's not a question I spend a lot of time thinking about. I've been in church my whole life. All I can remember is granddaddy saying Christ got up. I, I got baptized when I was seven. I've been preaching since college. I can't tell you the number of times I've uttered, shouted, whispered, written on the third day he got up. There's not been much mental space used on this what if. Paul makes it plain. He said, look, if Christ didn't get up, there's a whole lot of despair. If Christ didn't get up, there's no hope. If Christ didn't get up, then all of this. All this stress and strain, all the practices y'all had this week, everything we did to get ready for this great getting up morning, all of it was pointless and a waste of our time if he did not get up. Paul says, look, a world with no resurrection is a world with no hope, a world with no hope of the powers that be ever coming to tumbling down, a world where there is no after whatever this is on this side, where we're subject to choices beyond our control if Christ didn't get up. Life serves no purpose. Humanity then, he suggests, has no intrinsic value. All we have is that which is right here and right now. If Christ is not risen, then them seven daughters of thunder only had hot air. And all this, all the lilies, all the robes you'll see later, all the time spent in church preaching, teaching, singing, praising, then all of it is empty and a waste of our time. If Christ is not risen, then your faith, Paul says, is not worth it. And by faith here, he doesn't just mean what one believes, but he means the dynamic, proper relationship that we have with God. If Christ is didn't get up, then that relationship is empty and without any power. Then we don't have a bridge to the God that made everything. If Christ didn't get up, then nobody else can ever get up. If Christ didn't get up, then all of this is futile, pointless. We'd still be slaves to sin. Then the folk that we love, that we'd hope to see again, have perished, are dead and gone, and we'll never walk with them on the streets of gold. If he didn't get up, if Christ didn't get up, then we're fools who have wasted time, talent, and treasure, our energy. If Christ didn't get up, there's no point to any of us. Paul paints a picture of a world with no hope. If Christ didn't get up, there's no purpose and no meaning. 
then you might as well have sweats on this morning instead of your Easter Sunday best if you didn't get up. What a sad world that would be if Christ didn't get up. But then, as Paul drags us, admittedly, down a road we didn't want to go on, than a road that challenges us to think outside of our box and to try to imagine something that everything we do in worship, everything we do in study teaches us not to imagine. After Paul pulls us along on that road, almost like slamming on the brakes right before you get to the edge of the cliff. Almost like somebody in the car with you pulling and holding that loved one in the passenger seat. Even though the seatbelt is there, Paul reaches out an arm to keep us because he wants to secure us and make sure that we don't fly further than we wanted to go. Paul says all of that would be, would be hopeless. It would be horrible. But now, Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. That's what I needed to hear. That's what we came to declare today. Whew, I was thinking for too long. I almost forgot y'all this Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I know it. I feel it in my bones. I've been saying it for my whole life. I know it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. When you read it, Paul just says it. He assumes it. It's as if he knows that the community will fight him. For even calling us to imagine a world where it was not true that he get up. He makes an assertion at the end, assuming that the people he's talking to would already have disagreed with his line of thought. Paul is assuming that the folk that have lived this long and experienced what they've experienced would stop him in his tracks before he even gets to verse 20, number 20 and say, Paul, we know you are a pastor. Paul, we know you started this church. Paul, we know you met him on the road to Damascus, but I don't need you to tell me he's gotten up because I know he's risen all by myself. I know it. But how could Paul allow for such an assumption? What if someone questions, how can you say it? How can you say it today, March 31st, 2024, thousands of years removed from when historically he would have got up from the grave? How can we declare with such boldness in the face of all these ifs that are floating around? I mean, there's no proof, is it? There's no, no logical, scientific proof of the resurrection. In fact, the idea of someone being dead and coming back after three days is, contradicts everything we know about science, everything we know about death, everything we've ever seen about those near and dear to us. How can we prove that it's actually true? We don't have a surveillance tape of the empty tomb. There's no way of tracking the seismographic record of what was happening in the ancient Near East on that Easter Sunday morning many years ago to see if, in fact, there was an earthquake, see if, in fact, that stone was rolled away. All we have are the same things that Paul had, and that is some stories that have been given down to us through the years. The stories of Jesus' resurrection passed down by people of faith from generation to generation. I wish we had some proof. You know, Adam, the kind of proof we had to show when we was in school back in the day. I, I, I wish we had some proof. I mean, I'm excited to see. So don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm saying I'm standing here flat-footed. Seven ifs. This is my seventh eighth. I'm saying, y'all, he is risen. But it'd be easier to convince folk if we had some proof. For the central claim of our faith is that a brown-skinned rabbi from the Nazarene projects died at the hands of state-sponsored terror spurred on by a religious establishment that had gotten in bed with a narcissistic blunder of a man named Caesar. And not just that he died, but after dying on a Friday, he got up full of life on the following Sunday, raised from the dead, walking and talking, eating fish, and hanging out with his disciples. This makes no sense. It shatters all logic. It goes far beyond the bounds of any experience we've ever had and makes it hard to believe. Wouldn't it be easier if if we had some evidence? Wouldn't it be easier if we had just a photograph? Wouldn't it be easier if we had just, 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 just somebody's Facebook post about it? Wouldn't it be easier if 
somebody made a meme by the tomb, but the truth of Easter is that by the historical and scientific standards that we have on today, Deacon Roper, there is no proof. All we have are the same things that Paul had. Stories told down the years by faithful people from generation to generation. But maybe, my friends, that's the point. Maybe, as Paul writes to this congregation that he has known and loved these people who he had preached the gospel to, but people who had come to have doubts about the resurrection, it's almost as if Paul is screaming, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Paul, if I'm honest, it's pretty easy. For me to say there's no resurrection of the dead because I don't have any evidence. Folk that I love, they're they not here. Paul, it's easy to have doubt in the resurrection. But if we listen closely to what Paul writes back, Paul basically says, maybe you're right. Maybe you Corinthians are right. And all this resurrection talk is foolishness. Maybe when I preach to you that Christ was raised from the dead and that you who belong to Christ will be raised too, maybe I've been fooled. Maybe I've succumbed to the opiate of the masses. Maybe I'm lying. And if I'm lying, then your faith and my faith is in vain. You see, Paul is doing here, he's, he's moving from the rhetorical hypothetical to the practical present. He's, he's moving from the what ifs to the right now. He's, he's turning the lens of the experience away from these big lofty theological ideas and an event that he can't prove to the present tense and their own experience. Paul is basically saying, if you want to know whether or not the resurrection is true, you don't need any evidence of an empty tomb. You don't need to look back for a photo of what happened when Jesus get up. All you need to do is look in the mirror and ask yourself, how are you still here? Look and see the risen Christ in your own experience. Use your faith and look to see Christ risen in the world today. I don't have any more proof to give y'all on this morning more than the proof that you can provide for yourself. For if you look at your own life in faith and in this world we live in today, what kind of proof could we get that could satisfy us anyway? We just find somebody else in some Facebook group or somewhere on Twitter who agreed with our disappointments anyway. We can find somebody to co-sign all the foolishness, all the doubt we wanted to if we but looked hard enough there would never be enough proof that he got up from the grave one writer said that even if God rearranged the stars in the sky to say I really exist that the initial reaction would be dramatic and churches would spill over but after a little while the fad would fade and it wouldn't make any difference I believe like him that what we really need is not proof that there is a God somewhere or scientific evidence that a resurrection happened some time ago what we need is a God who is right here right now knee deep in the muck and the mire of our lives we need a risen Christ who who comes to us every day to give us life and energy and hope for tomorrow that's the kind of God I want to serve not a God proved by a video or a photograph but a risen Christ that's in relationship with me that I could call on right here and right now because he did something years ago he's with me on today and we get to be with him forever God isn't found when we make an ultimatum and say God give me proof I need proof that you exist right here right now or I'm gonna walk away I'm not gonna do it anymore no God can only be seen when we step out in faith and follow and when we step out in faith When we see the world through a brand new resurrection life, when we encounter Christ, when we feel the power of his presence, then we know in faith that Christ is raised from the dead and that our faith is not in vain. I know he got up when I see the seasoned saints that make their way to church each and every week. When I see the ushers still coming to church each and every Sunday, getting up early on Sunday morning to make sure we can be in the sanctuary. I know he got up when folk give their hard-earned money to make sure the church has what it needs and we can be a blessing to those in our community and beyond. I know he got up when I look at our deacons going out to visit faithfully. I know he got up when I hear those seven sisters preaching in this pulpit. I know he got up when I see our fight for justice continue and there be fruits of the labor that we work hard for. I know he got up when I see folk in the sanctuary who aren't black who feel like family and they realize that even through the particularity of the black church experience 
is they can still see and know God. I know he got up when I look out in the sea the way y'all embraced this rusty, dusty pastor eight years ago. I know he got up because we got folks shouting in the Bethany Baptist Church when they told me you could not hear or that you could hear a pin drop when I got to Newark. I know he got up because this morning I woke up with breath in my body with a little food in my belly. I know he got up because I've experienced grace, uh, unspeakable grace. Uh, I'm still here. I'm still standing. I'm still stronger. Uh, the record tells me that they killed him on Friday. The record says uh, that he stayed dead all day Saturday. But I know he got up uh, early Sunday morning uh, because his mercies are new every morning. Uh, and there is hope even in this place. Uh, I ain't got no proof, uh, but I can feel his power. There is no video, uh, but I still feel the vision. Uh, I don't have a picture, but there still is peace. Uh, there is no transcript of the words, uh, but he's transferred his grace to me. Uh, if you know he got up, uh, if you feel it down in your bones, uh, and if it's like fire, shut up in your bones. Uh, even at this sunrise service, uh, won't you help me uh, give some evidence? Uh, if uh, we know God is real, uh, you'll put your hands together. If uh, he's made a way out of nowhere, uh, you'll put your hands together. If you don't do it, uh, the rocks are going to cry out. Uh, if anyone is their new creation in Christ, uh, God will make you over. If you confess with your mouth uh, that Jesus is Lord uh, and believe in your heart uh, that God has raised him from the dead, uh, you will be saved uh, if God be for us. Uh, if God be for us. Uh, if God be for us. Uh, who can be against us? Say yeah. Say yeah. Give me some proof. Uh, let somebody know. That is real. For if he didn't get up, all of this is in vain. But I'm looking at some educated, Holy Ghost baptized, anointed folk in the sanctuary and choir on today. And y'all got too much good sense and too much spiritual discernment to be in here. Whatever time it is in the morning, if you didn't believe in your heart of hearts, if you didn't know deep down in your bones, even if you can't explain it, even if you don't have the words for it, even if you can't give anyone the, the scientific proof for why it is, you believe it just like I believe it. And I believe it because I'm looking at you and prayerfully you believe it because you're looking at me. Because we are all testimonies of God's grace, God's mercy, and God's power. Come on, testimonies all over this place. Won't you stand to your feet? If you know indeed that God is real and believe, uh, then indeed he got up from the grave. Won't you join me in a word of prayer? In fact, even if you still don't know for sure, I ask you to join me in this prayer too. Great God, thank you for allowing us to come and to worship you on this day. Thank you for getting us up early this morning, bringing us to your sanctuary, making the decision, God, to give your name, glory, honor, and praise. If we didn't believe, we wouldn't be here. If we didn't know your power, it would be a waste of time. If, God, you hadn't already saved us, we would have no hope. But I thank you, God, that we can transform our ifs to some I knows that we can transform our ifs to some we knows and prayerfully God through our witness, through our worship, through our love through our ministry, through our service we can transform some of their ifs to they knows that we believe in this Nazarene who beat death's game by his own rule and so I pray, God, that on this Easter, we are reminded, we are encouraged that our faith is reinvigorated as we remember, God, the central tenet, central claim of our faith. Give us, God, the boldness of fools 
We believe wholeheartedly, even if we can't make the legal brief, even if we don't have the medical file, even if we don't have the eyewitness account in the newspaper we trust. Help us to know that we know that we know that he got up and that when he got up, he got up with all power. And there may be God, one, under the sound of my voice on today, that want to God now in recognition of that knowledge make a commitment to you. They want a God to get to know you. Want to know this God that loves them so much. The God, maybe, just maybe there's someone that may even already know you. Might even believe this scandal of not only the cross but of the empty tomb, but is looking for a place to call home. Or maybe, God, you've called somebody on back home today. So, God, whether somebody's coming for the first time, whether somebody's coming to us for the first time, or whether, God, you're calling somebody on back home, the doors to the church are indeed open. It's in Jesus' great name we pray, amen and amen. Even on the sunrise service, you feel so moved on this morning. I want to be a part of what God is doing here. Bethany, you just want to be a part of God's family. We'd be so glad to welcome you on this day. Uh, we got deacons, even at this early service. God bless you all. Uh, so deacons, go ahead, wave your hand, and you can grab any of these wonderful folk you see uh, after service. They would be glad to welcome you uh, into God's body. We're so glad to welcome you. Uh, and with what God is doing in this place. Indeed, for those that are joining us at home or wherever you are, uh, there's a link right there in the chat that you can click, and we'll be right back in touch with you to welcome you uh, into God's house as well, to welcome you into the Bethany family. We'd be glad to get to know you and to welcome you into the family. And so even if for some reason you're watching the sunrise service at sunset or some other time, that link will still be live we'll still be glad to welcome you into God's house. Amen and amen. Come on, if you've been blessed at all by God today, won't you put your hands together and give God a, a sunrise praise. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It's my prayer that you know and feel early on this morning uh, that God is real. Not because the preacher shouted about it, but because you can look in the mirror and see God's grace all over your life. And frankly, that's all the proof I'll ever need. Know that we have a breakfast in a little bit. What time we start officially? Eight o'clock? Oh, we were getting out right on time. Amen. So we got breakfast uh, in a few moments. Join us down in the fellowship hall. Uh, you are welcome to come and to eat. Uh, and to leave, but you're certainly welcome to hang out for a little bit and come on back for our service at 10 o'clock, which is sure uh, to give God glory as well. Amen? Amen. Come on, listen to the Lord as we get ready to leave this place. Most gracious God, we love you. We thank you again for walking with us, for being with us, for calling us your own. Thank you, God, for being a God that has given us evidence in our own mirrors of your grace and your mercy and ultimately of your resurrection. Now to God who is able to keep us from stumbling, and to present us faultless in God's presence with extreme joy. The God our Savior who alone is wise. May our majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. And God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Go in God's peace, and may God's peace go with you. <laughs>